Hello, my name is Fred Kimball. I'm a software engineer at Northwestern Mutual. I'm here today with my colleague, Josh. Hi, I'm Josh Riley. I'm a lead software engineer at Northwestern Mutual. All right, we're here today to showcase our modern config-driven ELT framework uh, that we've been using on several of our teams here at NM. If you're not familiar with Northwestern Mutual, uh, we're a 160 plus year old company, uh, Fortune 102 company uh, that provides financial security to over 4.6 million people. Today we'll be discussing um, why we chose to go this route and designing and creating a config-driven ELT framework. Uh, we'll be going through our basic architecture and how the different components interact with each other along with our existing and new infrastructure. Uh, we'll be discussing our different configuration options that we've developed and how they interact with each other and how we can use uh, them together. And lastly, we'll be uh, talking about our security and consistency and data governance uh, features that we've baked into this framework. So as we began designing this framework, um, there were several things that we had to keep in mind. Uh, one of those things was, um, you know, we have hundreds of tables and jobs to migrate uh, from our old tooling to this new Spark and Databricks um, environment. Um, and we have a lot of team members and a lot of business deliverables to hit. Uh, so we can't necessarily all drop everything and learn all the nitty gritty details of Spark and Databricks and Delta and all these different new exciting tools uh, that we have at our disposal. Um, so we really try to think of a way that we can make the um, this framework something easy to use and easy to learn uh, for the whole team and even other teams eventually, um, given their current skill set, which was mostly uh, SQL and other BI tools. Um, in addition to speed, uh, we wanted to enforce some of our best practices, um, both put in place by us and some suggestions from Databricks. And we also wanted to put in place some uh, security and data governance uh, uh, features uh, to make sure that we're uh, following all of our enterprise standards as we uh, land data in this new environment. Lastly, um, the configuration files allow us to track changes more easily. Um, these changes, uh, you know, we can commit them to our source control and easily see um, which changes are being made. Um, each table essentially has its own config file. So um, if we see that one file is changing, we know that it's changing a very specific table. Um, another uh, benefit to using um, um, a, a config framework like this is uh, it reduces the um, testing surface. So um, we can test the Python framework by itself. And um, the, the development teams really only have to test their, their SQL queries and um, the config file. Um, and that really speeds up our development process. Um, another benefit is that it's reusable by many different teams. So uh, different teams across NM have been using this and uh, it's, it's not tailored to one specific team and it allows us to scale to the enterprise level. So let's take a look at our uh, basic architecture diagram. In the upper left of the diagram, you can see the, uh, the ELT config uh, box. This is our JSON configuration file. Um, it consists of one to many job items. Um, and a job item is basically a package of work for the framework to ingest and understand and execute. Um, within a job item, there is a single exec command. And that exec command um, executes some command. Um, and then lastly, there's a list of destinations that are optional. Um, so um, when the framework on the right side of the screen reads in this ELT config file, uh, the job item uh, reads in the config. It sends that config to the exec command, and that exec command um, usually reads data from some uh, source. So that source system can be a relational database, it can be a web API, or it can even be our Delta Lake. Um, so once once we get that data back from uh, you know a query we ran or some other command, um, that data frame gets sent back to the job item, 
And then the job item sends that data frame to a destination object. And that destination interprets uh, which format of destination it should be and any other options that need to uh, be applied on that destination. And it writes the data to the save location, whether that be a Delta table in our Delta Lake or a relational database or something else. Um, and on that note, I'll send it over to Josh and he'll walk through some of our configuration options we have in place. Thank you, Fred. As Fred had mentioned, we're going to take a look at the config options now. This framework was designed so that it uses these interfaces for the exec command and the destinations so that um, developers that work on the framework can extend it with whatever commands and destinations that they can think of. Um, that way we can fit all of our possible use cases. Uh, for exec commands, I'm going to walk us through you know, what some of these commands are. We have SQL exec commands. Uh, this is probably our most popular one. Uh, SQL exec commands always run a SQL command or you know, a SQL statement, and they can do that either in Databricks Delta or they could run that against a source database. And um, all exec commands need to return a data frame. Uh, so SQL exec command will just return the data that it gets from the query as a data frame. Uh, file read exec command. So this, this exec command can read CSV files, it can read JSON files, and uh, when it reads them, it'll turn them into a data frame and return it to the framework. API read exec command. So this is for web APIs. It's a programmatic way for the framework to call out to these endpoints, um, probably a get endpoint, uh, pull back some JSON data, turn it into a data frame, and uh, return that to the framework. XML read exec commands. So these are really for XML. They're kind of like file read exec commands, um, but XML need to have uh, XML needs to have schema applied so that it reads it into the correct format. Um, get incremental stats lower bounds command and the get incremental stats upper bounds command. So these are these are helper commands that we created um, for for use with incremental loads. Uh, we usually we apply them as kind of like a parameter to SQL exec commands um, so that uh, the SQL exec command, if it's reading data from a source system, it can know what what the lower bound limit and the upper bound limit needs to be. Um, and that that upper bound and lower bound are then stored in our stats table. Uh, uh, so that's that's kind of how that is tracked between loads for incremental loads. Custom Python module command. So the 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 custom Python module command enables developers to create their own Python modules, which could be installed via pip or however they want to get those Python modules onto the cluster. And then they can pass along some config as part of our you know, normal job item config file to this custom Python module, have it run, and then it just needs to adhere to the exec command interface where it needs to return a data frame as well. Uh, so all these exec commands, they need to return data frames, and then we pass them to our destinations and we can have um, you know, zero to many destinations in our job item. Uh, some of our destinations include Delta destinations. Uh, so Delta destinations are writing out to a file location. We mount uh, S3 buckets to our cluster and um, you know, write to them like a, like a file location. And then the Delta destination will also save it as a table. Uh, JDBC destination. So if, uh, let's say we have landed some data in our data lake and we've manipulated it, um, created some transformations, then we can use a JDBC destination to read from this, you know, this manipulated table and send it to another database like a RDS MySQL or something like that. Uh, 
temporary view destination. Uh, so this, this destination is kind of a way to make a more advanced uh, config file that has multiple job items in it, um, where maybe uh, one job item will, be, will read some data and then save it in a temporary view. And then uh, subsequent job items can read from that temporary view and save it in some other destination. Um, so that's a way of kind of adding some more programmability to your config and letting the developer break it down into a more simpler problem. Parquet destination, uh, real similar to Delta destination. Um, this is just writing to a file location in the Parquet format. And CSV destination, this is uh, also writing to a file location, but then using a CSV format. All right, let's take a look at what a typical landing config looks like. So here on the left-hand side, we have our config file, and it is an array of JSON objects. The JSON object is a job item. Uh, there's only one in this config, and each job item needs to have an exec and a list of destinations. Uh, so this job item has a SQL exec command. And then this SQL exec command is running a query, query my table raw.sql, which is a file in the same folder as this config. Uh, I have that on the right hand side. You can see it's just normal SQL. Um, there, there's also some options that we've configured into this SQL exec command. It has the partition column and the number of partitions options, which means that this SQL exec command is going to do a partition read. And uh, I can tell that this is also a SQL exec command because it doesn't have a, uh, a SQL exec command that's going to run against a source database rather than Databricks Delta because it doesn't have the source set to Delta. Uh, so this will use the ID column to partition on, and it'll run eight partitions uh, on its query using JDBC. Uh, so the SQL exec command will produce a data frame from that query, and it will the framework will pass it into the list of destinations. We only have one destination. It's the delta destination, uh, which means that it's going to save that data frame as a delta table. And uh, we have configured the encrypted columns. Um, so the framework will go through and replace the values for name and email in this case with encrypted strings. Let's go ahead and look at what a multiple job item config. So when we walk through what the various um, destinations were, I had mentioned that there was a temporary view destination. Uh, this config is leveraging that. Um, it has two job items in it. So the top job item is a SQL exec command. This one runs against Delta. It runs the query new records raw that SQL uh, query, which is on the right-hand side. And it, that'll produce a data frame, and the framework will save that in a temporary view um, as one of the destinations. Uh, and that temporary view is named my table new records. Uh, so this will let us have you know, subsequent job items we'll be able to read from that temporary view now. Uh, the second job item is also a SQL exec command um, that runs against Delta. And it runs the query my transform table raw.sql, which is on the right hand side. And uh, we can see that it is, it is reading from the temporary view, and then it is joining with another table. Uh, so um, the, the temporary view has given us a way to be uh, do some more uh, like programming with just config. Uh, then that, that data frame is then passed into a Delta destination, which is saved to Databricks Delta. All right, Fred, back to you to talk about the security and consistency features in this framework. All right. Lastly, as we are migrating these hundreds of configs and tables uh, and jobs uh, to this new framework, uh, we need to make sure that our sensitive data is secure. Um, we have and, and that our tables are created in such a way that it's consistent. Um, 
And that's important because we want to be able to uh, quickly be able to identify where issues are. Um, and if everything is standardized and the same, then um, it's easy to pinpoint those issues. Um, so on top of the security that we have in place uh, for accessing our environment, our resources, and the security that our, our cloud uh, providers provide, um, we wanted to add some extra security around our PII and PHI uh, data columns in our tables. Um, and how we do that is our framework is able to uh, retrieve which information on which columns are encrypted from our table metadata in our Delta Lake. And it goes and encrypts uh, all that data as it pulls it in from our source systems. So um, the data is never saved plain text in our environment once we bring it in. Um, and then once we have a need to, uh, a business need to read that data, um, those users with that business need um, or our jobs uh, will have access to decrypt that data using role-based access. If you're uh, curious on how we do some of that, uh, we do have a Databricks blog article written uh, with another colleague. It's called Enforcing Column Level Encryption and Avoiding Data Duplication with PII. Uh, you can go check out how we do that. Uh, along with securing individual columns, uh, we are also able to ensure that data is written out to the correct mounted storage locations uh, using the framework. Um, and we also have our uh, roles on our clusters set up correctly so that uh, whatever cluster you have access to, um, that cluster only has access to the buckets that you need access to. Um, and these locations are standardized based on which source uh, we're pulling the data from or uh, which uh, data or which database we're landing the data in uh, if it's a transformed uh, data table um, and that makes it easy to pinpoint issues uh, when we go to check uh, individual files or file locations um, so when the framework makes a, a connection um, outside of databricks um, we need to have uh, credentials and a uh, connection information. Um, so the connection information is set via connection config file, and that's uh, placed in our source control, which makes it easy to track changes to it. Um, it goes through all of our, um, our, our merge request approvals, all of our CI CD. Um, so any changes to that connection information uh, is tracked. And the credentials for those data sources are controlled through Databricks secrets. Um, and those Databricks secrets only allow uh, access based on your role. And um, most, most users will not have access to those directly. And uh, they'll have access via being able to trigger a framework job, but only the framework job running as a generic user will have access to um, those secrets. Uh, so it reduces the risk that um, users are bringing in data from some external source that you're not aware of. Um, so with the help of this uh, framework, we've been able to meet the needs of our business faster than ever. Um, and it's in a secure and consistent way. Um, hopefully this session has given you something to think about. Uh, if you're thinking of creating your own uh, or have your own uh, config-based uh, framework, um, thank you for joining the session and uh, please give some feedback if you can.